How do we know what we know? For millennia, humans have asked questions, hoping to find answers to all life's mysteries. How did we get here? And why are we here? From the times of Aristotle to Jesus, to scientists in this current year of 2015, we seek truth and a better understanding of how we relate to the world around us. This can be called ways of knowing. Some people find understanding of life on earth through the Bible, the first chapter called Genesis comes from the Hebrew word Rashid, meaning beginning. The Bible consists of two main sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is before Christ and is of prophetic stories, Jewish law, and history. The New Testament is of a Messiah whose Hebrew name is Yeshua. The English translation is Jesus. In the Old Testament, God created the universe, the earth, and the first man and woman named Adam and Eve. The Hebrew meanings for Adam and Eve are humanity and life. The Bible states that God created man in his own image. For many, the Bible represents hope during times of trouble and provides comfort through faith in God for answers unknown. Psalms 46, 1 God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Matthew 5, 4 Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The story of Job, found in the Old Testament, is often used to show triumph over tragedy and to find hope during times of despair. There are other ways in which humans have tried to create a better understanding and explain the mysteries of the world in which we exist. Aristotle, born in ancient Greece, 384 BC. He was a philosopher and scientist. He lived in a time when different gods and mythology were used to explain almost everything in space and on earth. Aristotle lived in a time which saw the birth of science, politics, philosophy, literature, and 
drama. Aristotle philosophized about all things regarding life. He said that everything that depends on the action of nature is by nature as good as it can be, and that it is our choice of good or evil that determines our character, not our opinion about good or evil. He said it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain thought without accepting it, and that if things do not turn out as well as we wish, then we should wish for them as they turn out. René Descartes was a French philosopher, scientist, mathematician, and writer. He is the father of analytical geometry, which is the bridge between algebra and geometry, and was crucial to the discovery of infinitesimal calculus and analysis. He said, it is not enough to have a good mind, the main thing is to use it well. He also said by a method I mean certain and simple rules such that if a man observe them accurately he shall never assume what is false is true. And Descartes' most famous quote in modern society is I think therefore I am. In China, the Tao is considered the first classical philosophical literature that deals with a divine order and the process of the universe. The Tao Te Ching is the second most translated book in history, next only to the Christian Bible. The Tao says, Gravity is the root of lightness, stillness the ruler of movement. And the soft overcomes the hard, and the weak the strong. In the modern world, many still meditate on the writings found within the Tao. They seek wisdom, inner peace, and balance. Charles Darwin was an English naturalist and geologist who lived between the years of 1809 and 1882. In 1831, he joined a five-year scientific expedition on the survey ship called the HMS Beagle. Darwin spent most of the five years on land, studying geology of different islands. One of his most important discoveries happened when he noticed that each island supported its own form of finch, which were closely related, but also had very important differences. 
In 1837, Darwin began writing about transmutation species. By 1838, he had created the theory of natural selection. Darwin worked on his theory for 20 years, and in 1858, with compelling evidence, he made his theory of evolution by natural selection public. In 1859, his book on the origin of species changed the way we understand our own existence and evolution forever. Sigmund Freud lived between the years of 1856 and 1939. He was an Austrian neurologist and is known as the father of psychoanalysis. Freud explored the human mind more thoroughly than anyone had before him. His aim with psychoanalysis therapy was to release repressed emotions and experiences. One of Freud's greatest contributions to modern psychology was the use of talk therapy, which is the notion that by simply talking about our problems, we can help to alleviate them. Freud also created another concept, that the human mind is divided into three parts with each having its own function. These parts are called the id, the ego, and the superego. Freud explained that these three parts develop at particular ages, beginning with the id at birth. The id is having an instinct that drives us. The instinct wants its desires fulfilled, and it wants gratification immediately. The id lacks the ability to be logical or to decide what is moral. The second part to develop around age two or three is the ego. The ego understands that the id's desires cannot always be satisfied and that the ego needs to decide how many of the id's desires can be fulfilled or expressed. The last to develop begins around age five and is called the superego. Freud explained the superego is our conscience and it decides between right and wrong. The superego punishes us with guilt when we have done something wrong. Wendell Berry, born August 5, 1934. He is an American novelist, poet, environmentalist, activist, cultural critic, and farmer. He is also a recipient of the National Humanities Medal. He has written several books, 
articles, and poems, including the Mad Farmer's poems. His interest in preserving the natural world around us is apparent within his writings, as well is his belief in family and love. The Man Born to Farming by Wendell Berry the grower of trees, the gardener, the man born to farming, whose hands reach into the ground and sprout. To him the soil is a divine drug. He enters into death yearly and comes back rejoicing. He has seen the light lie down in the dung heap and rise again in the corn. His thought passes along the row ends like a mole. What miraculous seed has he swallowed? that the unending sentence of his love flows out of his mouth like a vine clinging in the sunlight and like water descending in the dark. Long before the feminist movement was another woman, courageous and spirited. Her name is Kate Chopin. She was born Kate O'Flattery, February 8, 1850. She is considered to have been the forerunner of the feminist authors of the 20th century, although the term feminist was not yet used. Her childhood during the Civil War was tragic, having all of her siblings and father pass away. She was raised by her mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, all widows who were strong, independent women. In 1870, at the age of 20, she married Oscar Chopin, a wealthy businessman, and they had six children. However, in 1882, Kate was widowed when Oscar died suddenly from malaria. After unsuccessfully running her husband's business, Kate moved back home with her mother. However, the following year, her mother, too, passed away. A family friend and doctor suggested that writing could be therapeutic for Kate, who had developed depression. By the early 1890s, she was writing short stories and articles, many of which were published and placed in literary magazines. However, in 1899, her second novel received negative press and was highly criticized because it promoted values that went against the social code of that time. One of her best known stories is that of a woman trapped within the confines of an oppressive society. Kate Chopin was ahead of her time, passionate and courageous. She passed away of a brain hemorrhage August 20th, 1904, at the age of 54. James Welch was born in Browning, Montana. He attended school on both the Blackfoot and Fort Belknap reservations. Welch attended school at the Northern Montana State University and the University of Montana, where he earned his bachelor's degree. He found his niche for writing 
at the University of Montana. Although he began his career as a poet, he found his fame through writing fiction. His first novel, Winter in the Blood, earned him a critical acclaim and placed him as an author and leader of the Native American Renaissance. Winter in the Blood portrays the struggles and life of a young man who is caught somewhere between his Native American heritage on the reservation and that of the white man's world. In the year 2013, Winter in the Blood was made into a movie in Montana by Montana Natives and those who personally knew James Welch. Welch wrote about what it means to be an Indian in American modern society, and he wrote about the people of the West without glorification, without cliches, in an honest, clear voice from an intimate perspective. How do you relate to the world around you? The video you just watched touched on the lives of some extraordinary pioneers of their time. They came from different backgrounds and cultures, but all of them helped to pave the road to our present day. They thought outside of the box, they made new discoveries, and they created change. We all relate to the world around us in different ways. What are your ways of knowing?